so basically i am sunil chandra so welcome you all on behalf of united science foundation so this is our podcast event which is uh, termed as ask us and in this podcast we invite some expert from a particular field and we discuss informally discuss is like a like we chat we we like communicate on a certain theme and this united science foundation is a registered society this is basically a registered society which is meant for students teachers and educators and it organizes several several programs offline and online and this is uh, our logo of united science foundation so basically it is it is a, a a group of professionals from education research industries government organization and executives it is like a mix of all these uh, fields and we try to uh, i mean reach our society to energize more uh, young students educators for, uh, for the science basically science to inculcate the scientific attitude in the society and we also have fb twitter instagram where or on our uh, official web page where you can find uh, detailed informations we also have science communications through publishing science news highlights every month second edition is to come by the end of uh, august 2021 and one can subscribe it through email and it's uh, free we uh, are dependent on supports from the uh, contributed uh, supports from the people uh, either the members and others from uh, in our society so please support us by your kind donations also support us by being part of our organization to enrich our human resource our ed educators board or like our regional communicators and if you want you can also become a full time member of our society so this is a highlight of uh, i mean uh, a snapshot of science news highlight of the this month please free uh, feel free to subscribe through this these emails now i'll focus to what why we are here our today's session where we have professor patrick das gupta as our expert he is a professor in department of physics and astrophysics in university of delhi new delhi basically there is a very nice uh, video of him in a, i mean his interview given on uh, given to rajasabha tv there they have very nicely uh, introduced him so i feel very uh, tiny in front of professor das gupta to introduce him anyway professor das gupta had Uh, has done his uh, integrated msc from bits pilani and later he joined tata institute of fundamental research tf from mumbai uh, for his phd and later he uh, joined uh, De uh, delhi university department of physics and astrophysics as a, a lecturer and then now he is a professor there since 2040 uh, 2004 basically his main research is uh, dedicated to the basically theoretical astrophysics cosmology and he is a really really very distinguished physics uh, teacher in delhi university and beyond and we are uh, the united science foundation is uh, blessed by his uh, uh, presence as uh, as an advisory board member of the, our organization and today in this session we will be mostly focusing on quantum mechanics aspect of our life i mean we will be trying to associate quantum mechanics to our general understanding of universe general understanding of the systems we are uh, familiar with so i will not waste time i will just show you one example which we have uh, studied in our 
college days quantum mechanics classes. It's a Stern Gerlach experiment. And this is very classic experiment, which is uh, uh, taught to strengthen the idea why you need quantum mechanical approach to understand some systems. Why classical mechanics is not capable of explaining some of the observe of, of some of the observations what we see in nature. So for the people, I will just tell that in this experiment there was a furnace where a silver is heated and silver atom is collimated and is passed through in homogeneous magnetic field. You can see that these are two poles, north and south poles, and it, it, that is to apply in homogeneous uh, magnetic field on the silver atom. And you know, silver atom is basically having a spin angular momentum of the just one last electron in its uh, outer uh, most cell, and that one electron is guiding the angular moment of, uh, momentum of entire AZ atom, silver atom, and magnetic field is applied on that. And in, as per the classical prediction, you see a continuous di distribution on the screen, but actually we see there is only two kind of, uh, two components in the distribution. So basically we don't see continuous distribution. And this was a really fantastic experiment showing that how we you need quantum mechanics to understand uh, nature in, in specifically in the uh, uh, micro world. Okay, I will not take much of your time. This was just to show one example, just to revise one very basic uh, quantum mechanics class. So I'm not saying that today will be uh, we will be just talking like the classes what you attended in university or college days. Here we want you uh, want you to come out with many more questions for Professor Das Gupta and us so that we can understand this very difficult. So it's a uh, quantum mechanics is uh, mostly difficult for college students. And it's, uh, we can come up with very nice picture of this difficult uh, subject, okay? So I will end my uh, introduction by this uh, uh, quote, the education is an ultimate medium to enrich our society and education can be obtained by many, many media. And here, this is efforts of United Science Foundation are also a medium which one can use, utilize to enrich their uh, information. So stay tuned for many uh, more uh, programs or uh, by United Science Foundation and suggestions or comments are always welcome on our email. So now I will invite Professor Das Gupta to uh, start the session. Thank you, sir. I will stop my uh, screen. You can share your screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Sunil Chandra. Uh, I am really um, honored to uh, share with you uh, this particular platform. I also thank Sunil, Dipti, Mankaj Kushwa, and all other uh, members of the United Science Foundation and uh, they are all doing fantastic work for furthering uh, science education and building up a scientific temperament. Uh, now, what I will do, uh, by the way, uh, for a brief while, I will show myself. Are you able to see me? There is a bandwidth problem and therefore, I would like to um, keep the video off. All right. Yes. So I just uh, switch off the video. Are you able to see me? Yes, sir. Okay. 
I'll, I'll, I'll switch up the video. All right. So let me now share the screen with you. Are you able to see the screen that I've shared? Yes, sir. All right, I'll just go into the presentation mode. Okay, so uh, I'll just present a small quantum of quantum theory in these slides. We all know that quantum mechanics at the turn of the 20th century completely revolutionized the world of physics and the world of philosophy. The reason why it revolutionized the world of philosophy is that it brought in fundamentally an a causal and probabilistic picture of the world. And of course, the whole quantum theory was completely counterintuitive. For example, if you are sending photons or electrons or protons, and the rate at which you are sending coherent beam of electrons, protons, atoms, or photons is very low. That means every five minutes, the source emits the particle. And if you have a screen with two slits, then even though a single particle is being emitted by the source in every five minutes, after a long time, when you wait, you find that the distribution of the particles that have hit the screen has an infer interference pattern, which is built up. Okay. So this is completely counterintuitive because you will say that the particle must have either gone through the upper slit or the lower slit. And therefore, why should there be an interference? Now it turns out that particles are neither particles, waves are neither waves, but they have properties of particles as well as waves. So even though you're sending atoms or C60 molecule or photons or electrons, there is a wave function associated with the particle. And when the two slits are open, the wave front, when it encounters the screen with the two slits, only through the slits, portions of the wave front appear and these two wave fronts interfere and lead to the interference pattern. So therefore, this particular behavior is completely contradictory to our classical notions of particles. Similarly, quantum mechanics is very necessary. Otherwise, we would not have a stable material world and we will have, therefore, no living systems or no human beings to talk about quantum mechanics. The reason is that if quantum mechanics was not there, you will not have stable atoms. The electrons around a positively charged nucleus will simply accelerate downwards to the nucleus within 10 to the power minus eight second, and therefore you will not have stable atoms. In fact, the fact that we exist means that quantum mechanics must be correct. And furthermore, our day-to-day -day lives use quantum mechanics in such a plethora that all predictions of quantum mechanics are essentially, have been 
verify. For example, your mobile phone has semiconductor devices which would not be possible without quantum mechanics. For example, the band gap between the conduction band and the valence band, it comes about because of quantum mechanics and it is mainly these features of semiconductors where valence band and conduction band have a band gap of few electron volts, which makes diodes, transistors, and all semiconductor material that your mobile phone or television or any device which consists of reading and giving output like computers, all these devices rely on quantum mechanics. You might ask then why is classical mechanics still valid in the macroscopic world? It turns out that there's a theorem called Ahnfest theorem in quantum mechanics. And from Ahnfest theorem, one can average out physical quantities. And when you average out, then indeed the Newtonian classical physics emerge out of averaging of quantum mechanical formulation. The other aspect of quantum mechanics, which is very fundamental, is that although complex variables like imaginary number i, which is square root of minus one, they were used by physicists even before the birth of quantum mechanics, but they were used as tools like Fourier transform or solutions of polynomials, but they were not thought to be something which are present in the world around us. But it is quantum mechanics which established that the com complex variables are part of our physical world because state of a system uh, which is described by wave functions are complex and the Schrodinger equation, which tells you how the state evolves with time has explicitly iota in it, where iota is square root of minus one. So therefore it is a Planck's constant H and square root of minus one, which govern the world of quantum mechanics. Historically, of course, quantum mechanics developed because the black body spectrum, which is so very important in macroscopic world, including the, our, our universe, for example, you know that the cosmic microwave background, which was one of the clear proofs for the Big Bang universe, the cosmic microwave background is essentially a perfect black body spectrum and here the black body spectrum intensity as a function of wavelength has been shown here and you can see in the black body spectrum the Planck's constant h appears explicitly of course thermodynamical quantity like Boltzmann constant also arrives uh, in the Planck spectrum but it is to obtain the observed Planck spectrum theoretically that Planck devised a very novel idea that energy must come as quantization of Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency of the radiation. And it is the black body radiation that ushered in quantum mechanics. All right. So classically, of course, one cannot get the observed black body spectrum, you'd only get the Rayleigh genes law, but only when you apply Planck's hypothesis that the radiation energy must come as bundles of quanta, each having energy, H nu, that you find that you can derive the black body spectrum that explains the observed nature of the black body spectrum. And because Planck made the 
hypothesis that energy of electromagnetic radiation of frequency nu have to come as bundles of quanta each having energy h nu and these quanta today we call photons and then of course einstein used the idea of quanta to explain photoelectric effect where when radiation impinges on metals like sodium cesium etc these photons eject out the electrons in the metal and uh, these ejected electrons are indeed seen and only when you apply the quantized uh, version of electromagnetic radiation you can explain the photoelectric effect and today of course our day to day life in lives in cities are ruled by photoelectric effect whether it is the detectors for example when you walk through a uh, uh, region in a metro station uh, and when you walk through then there is a, a beep these are all governed by photoelectric effect because in the walk through gate there is a beam which is falling on a uh, photoelectric cell uh, and when you walk through the beam is interrupted and the current gets halted and because of that there is a signal that someone has entered the gate photoelectric effect is one of the uh, quantum mechanical effect that has been used again and again uh, in various electronic devices defenses and so on so photoelectricity in fact rules our day to day lives then the observation of discrete spectra uh, emerging from various elements whether hydrogen uh, or uh, the magnesium uh, gas or mercury any element if you excite it the radiation emanating from excited elements when you pass through a dispersion medium like prism or diffraction grating you will find that what you observe are discrete lines and not a continuous band unlike what happens when sunlight goes through a prism there you see a continuous band of different colors and not the discrete lines the reason is the sunlight can be approximated greatly as a black body spectrum and black body spectrum is continuous while the radiation coming out of excited elements like hydrogen magnesium calcium sodium etc the radiation uh, come not in all frequencies but only in certain frequencies and in general from quantum mechanics one can show if you take any bound quantum mechanical bound system the energy levels are discrete and because of the discrete energy levels you see such discrete lines in other words if quantum mechanics was not there then an electron going around a nucleus would not be occupying discrete level it will just uh, due to maxwell's relation it just circulate spiral and fall onto the nucleus in less than 10 to the power minus 8 second and therefore if quantum mechanics was not there atoms will not be stable and therefore we will not exist and in particular it is the quantum mechanics which tells us there are the bound states of electrons in uh, any atom due to the positively charged nucleus the bound states have discrete energy and uh, for hydrogen like atoms in particular you can easily solve uh, and you will find that the energy levels go as minus 13.6 times the atomic number to the power 2 divided by n square where n is the uh, the principal quantum number of the level going from n equal to 1 n equal to 2 n equal to 3 and so on and one of the fundamental things that de broglie gave uh, when uh, to explain the bohr quantization rule was that if you have any particle uh, with mass m moving with speed v so that mv is the momentum 
then it is associated with a de Broglie wavelength whose value is Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle. And it is the matter waves that leads to the interference pattern. And for example, uh, atoms have been shown to uh, show the interference pattern. And even carbon-60, the so-called fullerene, also shows uh, the interference pattern showing that as heavy a molecule as carbon-60, that is fullerene molecule, also behaves quantum mechanically. Uh, let me accelerate. So we have seen that the wave nature of light or electrons or protons or fullerene um, atoms are uh, experimentally verified. And the fact that photoelectricity cannot be explained from classical electromagnetic theory, you need the idea of photons, which are quantums, quanta of electromagnetic energy and so on. And this is the actual photograph of the interference experiment uh, due to uh, electrons, which shows that uh, to begin with, you don't see the interference pattern because one electron or one photon per minute is going through the two slits, but you wait for a great amount of time and soon you see, start seeing the interference pattern. And this happens only when both slits are open. So in other words, quantum mechanics tells us that when a source of electron, proton, atom, uh, when it goes to a single slit, the slit width will let a wave packet of the wave function to go through. And But when you have two detectors A and B, then both detectors don't detect the particle. Either B will detect or A will detect. When A detects the particle, the wave packet collapses to a narrower uh, wave packet. If B detects, then around the detector B, the particle collapses to a state of a narrower wave packet. And this collapse doesn't follow a deterministic rule. It's completely random. No amount of prediction can be made as to which detector will detect the particle A or B. So indeterminism or the random nature of quantum mechanical uh, systems is fundamental. And therefore it brought about a complete change in the whole of philosophy that our universe is not deterministic. Probabilities and uh, randomness are fundamental to our universe. But then it also led to a lot of philosophical uh, puzzles, like for example, we know from the study of our cosmology that the universe began from a very hot and dense state, the so-called Big Bang state, and the universe started expanding and the matter started cooling, the cold matter became the first stars, then galaxies, and galaxies had the second generation of stars, uh, and so on, and finally, Elements were synthesized, planets were formed, elements in the planets formed, biomolecules, life was formed, and then the human beings with greater uh, brain power were formed. And today, we human beings, our brain, everything is made out of all these atoms which are quantum mechanical. And these quantum mechanical atoms in our mind, they are trying to understand the laws of nature the laws that govern the quantum mechanical behavior of atoms. It is as though quantum mechanical entities are trying to understand quantum mechanical entities themselves. So it's a big philosophical puzzle. And we, have al we already know the notion of wave function and the fact that a wave function in the position representation, uh, its physical interpretation is psi star psi, which is mod psi square. It gives us the probability density. Let me not devote more time into it uh, because I would rather have uh, questions from you. So we will come back to all these when there are questions. So uh, uh, let me just tell you that the dynamical equation, that means how the wave function evolves with time 
that is determined by the so called schrodinger equation which reads as iota which is square root of minus 1 iota into h bar h bar is h divided by 2 pi iota h bar del psi by del t is a hamiltonian operator acting on psi and for a non relativistic particle the hamiltonian operator is the kinetic energy operator minus h bar square to m del square and plus the potential energy operator here there is a typo there should be a bracket so bracket starts here and bracket ends after the potential energy and it is this schrodinger equation which tells us how the state of the system governed by the wave function evolves with time we have already talked about the wave particle duality that every particle when you have a localized detector and detect the particle either you in the particle you'll find the particle here or here or here or here etc but if you don't try to detect the particle in a localized manner then it remains say extended wave form and then as i said the outcome of the measurement is random if you try to measure whether it is here or here or here you will find it somewhere but you can't predict where you will find it you can find it here or here or here or here and so on and probability or randomness appear only when a measurement device interacts with your quantum mechanical system and that is one of the most unsolved fundamental puzzle if there is a question later i will talk about it. and we know that uncertainty principle it protects quantum mechanics against several paradoxes uh, so let me go into the thing so one of the counter intuitive part of quantum mechanics is tunneling quantum tunneling as you know if there is a barrier classical particle in order to cross the barrier it has to climb up to the hill and then go down that means its energy has to be greater than the barrier energy but quantum mechanics tells us that even if the energy of a particle is smaller than the potential barrier height it can quantum mechanically tunnel and it is seen not only in the radioactive decay the so called gamma explanation of alpha particle decay but it is also used in uh, tunneling scanning tunneling microscope where if you have a sample uh, like uh, crystalline gold or copper or any sample then what you have is a piezoelectric uh, tip tip and the tip is very sharp that means a microscopic view of the tip is that it is also made out of atoms and when the tip is very close to these uh, atoms either you can have a microscopic quantum mechanical force and because of that this will either go near it or further and piezoelectric uh, sensor will sense it so that you can map the electron distribution of the atoms or you can use the tunneling effect where the uh, tip which is very close to the electronic clouds of wave function around atoms then the electron will tunnel from the atom to the tip and close the circuit and the clicking of the circuit will tell you the electron density because the tunneling probability will depend upon the mod psi square of the electron distribution around atoms so scanning tunneling uh, telescope they use this quantum mechanical picture and uh, quantum mechanics tells us there are two kinds of particles fermions or bosons bosons have this fundamental behavior that below the critical temperature all bosons will like to occupy the same state while fermions behave diametrically opposite uh, to bosons you can show that no two identical fermions can have the same state that means if you have the same energy level then the same energy level can occupy, occupy at most two identical fermion so if you are talking about electrons so you can have in every single energy level either an electron will spin up or electron will spin down so only two electrons can occupy the single state 
because according to Pauli exclusion principle, no two identical fermions can have identical quantum state. And it is because of this Fermi-Dirac statistics of half integral spin particles like electron, protons, et cetera, that semiconductor devices are possible because in the semiconductor device, what you have is that the valence band uh, cannot be occupied at the ground state by all electrons. So when you have a large number of electrons, <coughs> then you have to fill every level only by two electrons. Finally, the upper level is called the Fermi uh, level. The highest energy level that is filled by two electrons is the Fermi level. And it is a Fermi level and the conduction level. And between that, the gap, it is this which leads to all kinds of uh, spectacular uh, array of uh, diverse properties of semiconductors that have given us so many different electronic devices starting from uh, transistors, diodes, ICs, uh, MOSFETs, and with uh, the current quantum nanoparticles, a whole lot of uh, quantum mechanical uh, microsystems ruling our uh, electronic devices have arrived. On the other hand, for bosons, when you lower the temperature of identical boson, then when the de Broglie wavelength of the bosons, because when you lower the temperature, the average momentum decreases. So H by momentum, which is a de Broglie wavelength, becomes larger. And when the de Broglie wavelength becomes very long, much longer than the interparticle separation, then the entire system behaves like a quantum mechanical uh, uh, fluid, the so-called Bose-Einstein condensate. And it is because of Bose-Einstein condensate, you have superconductors and superfluids uh, that arise. And every one of you might have seen how for a superconductor, when you take a uh, high temperature superconductor, put on it a bar magnet like this tablet, and when you pour liquid nitrogen, when the high temperature superconductor uh, object becomes superconductor, it repels the uh, magnet and the magnet floats on the top. All these are possible because of quantum mechanics, because what happens is Cooper pairs, the electron with spin up and the electron with spin down, they pair up and they form a Bose-Einstein condensate and the entire Cooper pair state flows, it is described by a wave function, psi, and it leads to all kinds of uh, strange behavior like Josephson effects. Uh, that is, even without a voltage source, there can be current between two superconductor in between which there is a thin insulator and so on. And it, it is essentially the wave function of the Cooper pair that causes the superconductivity, Josephson effect, Meissner effect, and so on. Similarly, in case of liquid helium, because helium is a boson, when you lower the temperature of helium, the helium goes into a Bose-Einstein uh, condensate phase where a large number of helium atoms, they are described by wave function. And the wave function, they tunnel through test tube and they can just crawl into a test tube, or if your test tube level of superfluid is higher, they will tunnel out of the test tube and fall on the beaker. All kinds of magical behavior is portrayed by this macroscopic quantum phenomena. Let me go ahead. And Bose-Einstein condensate have been shown to millions and hundred millions uh, atoms as Bose-Einstein condensate show interference pattern showing that even 10 to the power 8 atoms together show the quantum mechanical behavior of interference pattern. Uh, let me not uh, go into all these. Uh, the magic uh, 
uh, solid state device material called graphene where uh, the sheet thin sheet of carbon a single layer carbon atoms behaves so differently satisfying a dirac equation follows from quantum mechanics similarly the laser as you know in the case of laser you have stimulated emission where if you create a population inversion where most of the atoms are in a higher metastable state then a single photon going by would cause all the atoms to decay together and all the photons resulting out of the decay will be moving in the same direction with same frequency and same phase the so called stimulated emission which causes the laser activity this is purely possible because in the laser the photons have become both instant condensate so they would all like to be in the same state and lasers have so much of practical applications in our day to day world whether it is in your computer the readout uh, device or whether it is your uh, pointer in your top the so called laser pointer and so on or in defense uh, for laser guns lasers are used to pinpoint the target so that it can be fired well uh, and lasers would not have been there if quantum mechanics were not around and today we know that lasers are being used in the ligo detectors the so called laser interferometric uh, detectors which for the first time directly detected gravitational waves and ligo india project is planning to use very sophisticated lasers including the speech states of light where uh, you can uh, squeeze the uh, laser light in order to uh, have a greater sensitivity for the um, ligo detector and the speech states are again quantum mechanical states of laser light and uh, let me not go into this uh, already uh, sunil chandra has already explained the so called stern gerlach apparatus and how uh, uh, the splitting of the states reveal that a initially superposed state of spin up and spin down because of the inhomogeneous magnetic field uh they get entangled with position they function and either you find the electrons here or there that we not uh, concentrate on that but the point is such entangled state so to begin with this was a product state the spin state multiplied by the uh position space wave function but when it went to a inhomogeneous magnetic field because of the inhomogeneous magnetic field the spin state and the position state got correlated and therefore spin up got correlated with wave function position space wave function down and spin down got correlated with uh, position wave function uh, down this was sorry this was up and this was down and such a state is called an entangled state why entangled because the spin degrees are entangled with position degrees so now the state of the system cannot be factorized into spin state multiplied by the position state rather it is a superposition of product of two states so this is a product this is a product but the final state is a superposition of such a state and such entangled states are they lead to all kinds of bizarre quantum mechanical behavior and they are thought to be useful for the future uh, quantum computers so you can have a qubit zero qubit and another qubit another zero qubit in one state and a qubit with one and another qubit with one in one state but you can superpose that so that you have a entangled state and then you can perform quantum compute computing parallelly because the first qubit will do one quantum com uh, computation while the one part will 
do another quantum computation and so on. But finally, when you read out, I'll either you will read out this or these, and parallel computation will happen, and uh, that will make quantum mechanics faster. Uh, let me not go into the philosophical device and how quantum mechanics can be uh, applied to macroscopic uh, astrophysical system by black holes. But if there are questions, I can answer it. So I will uh, formally stop here. But depending on questions, I can come back to the slides. So I would be happy if uh, participants ask any question they have. Any. Remember, ultimately in science, science is all about not believing. Science is all about skepticism. And therefore, in science, we practice questioning and using sophisticated mathematical and experimental uh, tools to find out where lies the truth. Thank so please you, ask me any question, whatever yeah. you wish. Yeah, uh, it was really very insightful journey uh, about the introduction of quantum and classical realm. And definitely you have fantastically established that whatever world we see, the detailed behavior lies in quantum way of reality. Actually, uh, you, you very nicely said that atoms are stable because of quantum mechanics and we are existing because of the interactions of atoms with one uh, with, with similar or different ones. So definitely we uh, are governed by quantum mechanics. If there is no doubt. So there are many uh, questions, many doubts, and we also want to uh, have a flow of our session based on certain uh, mode. So as you mentioned in, 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 uh, in your slides that the, there is this photoelectric effect, which is direct, uh, uh, direct uh, I should say, direct implication of quantum mechanics. So basically, we want to start from there. So can you uh, try to explain the photoelectric effect in a very general, very general means without using any mathematics or anything? Can we just relate that? Uh, I mean, can you explain that? And can we relate it to the Schrodinger's wave equation? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's go. Yeah. So. Photoelectric effect, of course, uh, was a puzzle around 1900, uh, first decade of the 1900, till Einstein in 1904 used the Planck's idea to solve the observed photoelectric effect. So, according to classical electromagnetic radiation, if you have an electromagnetic wave falling on the metal, then According to classical electromagnetic uh, waves, the intensity of the electromagnetic waves, more intense is the electromagnetic wave, more higher the energy. But in photoelectric effect, what one saw was that supposing you are using red light, no matter how intense is the red light, it doesn't cause photo ejection of electrons. While if you take UV lamp, very weak UV lamp, even a weak UV lamp falling on metal would eject the electrons with greater energy. This could not be explained by Maxwell's idea of electromagnetic waves. Einstein immediately realized that if you think of the electromagnetic waves as consisting of a series of quanta called photons, and therefore for UV light, because UV radiation has a greater frequency, even if the UV lamp is weak, but nevertheless, the number of the photons, each photon of UV has higher energy, and it is this, each photon ejects one electron. So one photon will cause ejection of one electron because UV photons are more energetic because H nu, nu is higher, it can cause ejection while red light, red lamp, no matter how intense the red lamp is, but each of the 
red photon, H nu, nu is much lower. Each of this red photon has lower energy. It cannot eject the electrons. Okay. And therefore, red lamp light cannot cause photoelectric uh, effect while UV or blue radiation can cause photoelectric effect. How do you, later on, when you try to understand the whole mechanism of ejection of photoelectric eff effect from Schrodinger equation to point of view, what you do is you write down the Schrodinger wave function for the electrons governing the metals. And when your photons with different energy are coming in, because your wave function tells us that for bound state, the, there are discrete energy level. And therefore, when an electron comes and interacts with the ground state atom, the, the photon, sorry, the photon of right energy comes and interacts with the ground state atom, the ground state electron goes into the higher energy state. So it absorbs the energy and goes to higher energy state. So similarly, in the case of photoelectric effect here, when the photon energy is so high, that the electron, when it absorbs it, it goes to a zero energy state, that means continuum state, zero energy state, so it escapes the metal. And it is the Schrodinger evolution of the electronic wave function from the ground state wave function to the free electron wave function. And normally, when you study uh, radiation theory in quantum mechanics, you use a perturbation theory where the photon is described by a uh, Hamiltonian operator of having a sinusoidal time dependence. And this perturbation, when it interacts with the quantum mechanical uh, system where the ground state is a bound state wave function psi i, and the final state is a free uh, state psi f, and you can use the perturbation theory to calculate the probability that to start with a brown state, ground state, or a bound state wave function psi i, what is the probability that the perturbation, and we always study how in the perturbation theory, we can go from uh, one state to another state transition, and one can explain thereby the entire photoelectric effect. Is that the answer you uh, wanted, Sunil? Yes, sir. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, sir, related to this, there is uh, one student, uh, Ridhi, she asked like, how IOTA governs the quantum mechanics? Because we, if we see that Schrodinger equation includes I term, that is IOTA, and how it governs our quantum mechanics. Very good question. So, for example, the iota appears explicitly in the Schrodinger equation. Okay. And the entire, therefore, as a simplicity, suppose today we want that I want an energy eigenstate. That means I want a state psi which corresponds to a definite energy. What will you do? You will take this energy operator act on the psi. If the psi corresponds to an energy eigenstate, the energy operator acting on psi will give you the energy eigenvalue e into psi. So then you will have the equation Hamiltonian operator acting on psi will be e into psi. You'll ask, what is the wave function then? Then you solve it i h bar del by del T of psi equal to E psi, where E is a energy eigenvalue, some real number E psi, then what is the solution? Del psi by del T will be E divided by I h bar psi. E divided by I h bar is minus iota into E by h bar into psi. And what is the solution? The solution is simple. Solution is exponential of 
minus i by h bar into e into t into some initial size zero. So you see the e rest for minus i by h bar e into t gives you the how the wave function evolves with time, the so-called stationary state. And the phase of the stationary state is simply e by h bar, energy divided by h bar. So therefore, as you can see, the presence of iota governs the nature of solution of the wave function psi. Not only this, the entire, uh, I don't know why my slide has got stuck. I'm not able to move, wait. Okay. Due to some reason, I'm not able to. Uh, sir, yeah. maybe, okay, now, yeah. now I'm able to move. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the entire Heisenberg uncertainty principle, normally when you study uncertainty principle, in the undergraduate modern physics level, you talk in terms of a photon, when it interacts with the electron, it imparts a momentum. And because photon itself has energy h nu and h nu divided by c will be the momentum. And therefore, when it interacts with the electron, it imparts a momentum to the electron. So electron state gets changed. And not only that, to Therefore, no longer the momentum of the electron is the original momentum. And not only that, the position uh, part, you will be not be able to get the full picture because of the uh, uh, diffraction limitation, which says delta theta angular resolution power is 1.22 times wavelength of the light divided by the uh, diameter of the telescope. So the wavelength, unless the wavelength is zero, delta theta will never be zero. So there'll be always uncertainty in the position. Although this is the description given for Heisenberg uncertainty principle in our modern physics course, but in the real mathematical <coughs> version of quantum mechanics, the origin of uncertainty principle is actually due to the fact that all dynamical variables like position, momentum, etc., they are represented by self-adjoint operator. So momentum operators, Px, Py, Pz, in the position representation, of course, they are minus i h bar del y del x, minus i h bar del y del i, del y minus i h by h bar del y del z, and so on. So position, momentum, they are all operators. And you can see that if you take the commutator bracket of position and momentum, that means commutator bracket of x and px, that would be x px minus px x, you will find x px minus px x will turn out to be iota into h bar. So commutator of x px is iota into h bar. And it is this iota into h bar, which is responsible for the uncertainty principle. You can prove in quantum mechanics that if you take any two operators A and B, if the commutation, that means AB minus BA is iota into C, where C is a, another operator. So AB minus BA, if it is equal to IC, you can prove that delta A into delta B will be average value of the operator C divided by four. And it is this which is responsible for the uncertainty principle. So iota plays an important role, not only in the Schrodinger equation and the solutions of the wave function, but it also plays a role in the uncertainty principle. All right? Yes, sir, yes. Uh, I, I think this way you have already ex uh, explained uh, questions by Pankas who wanted to uh, uh, some practical understandable example of Heisenberg uncertainty principle and also the one by Ritika Dube who wanted to uh, know that what are the application of Schrodinger, Schrodinger's equations. So, yeah, if so they, Pankaj, the, yeah. uh, you can practically see 
the um, Heisenberg uncertain principle, particularly the energy and time uh, uncertainty principle are seen in the width of the spectral lines. You can see that for any spectrum, you will see the line widths. And the line widths are correlated with the lifetime of the excited atoms. If the lifetime of the excited atoms is very short, then the corresponding line will be wider. While a long-lived atom or a metastable state, when you have a metastable state where the atomic state can live for a long time, then when there is a transition, the photon has is sharper, the energy uh, spectrum is sharper. That means width of the uh, spectral line is shorter. In fact, that is the reason why in laser, you have such a good monochromatic wave because in lasers, you uh, do a population inversion with a metastable uh, state where the metastable state is a long wavelength, a long time uh, stable state. So when they undergo stimulated emission when they come down, the photon has a much sharper frequency and therefore you have a much better monochromatic laser wave. Okay, And of course, for position uh, momentum uncertainty, you can see the example even in the so-called Bose-Einstein condensate. So here, for, for example, this is uh, a picture of Bose Einstein condensate. So you can see that the momentum uncertainty, um, when the temperature is higher, the momentum uncertainty is larger. But when you go to a much lower temperature, when you go to a almost zero degree uh, nano, I mean, not zero degree, you can't go to zero degree Kelvin, but we go to nano Kelvin temperature, even then, the width is not zero. There is a uh, position width, and this width is due to the fact that the atoms are all almost in identical energy state. And because the uncertainty in energy or momentum is very tiny, and therefore the position uncertainty must be large. On the other hand, classically, you would have expected that if I cool it, like for example, when I cool from 200 nano Kelvin to 100 nano Kelvin, you indeed found that the position uncertainty decreased. But then you would have thought, you would have, you would think that by cooling it further, you can decrease your uncertainty. But you don't. You actually increase because now you are in a quantum mechanical uh, state, namely Bose-Einstein condensate, and because all the bosons are in the same energy state. So the momentum uncertainty is very small. And because the momentum uncertainty is small, the position uncertainty must be very large. And that's the reason why the width is bigger than when it was 100 nanometers. Okay, Pankaj? Uh, yeah, perfect. Now we can take another question by uh, Rabi Prakash Mishra. He's so asking like when, uh, how Schrodinger thought that when discovering the Schrodinger's equation? Yeah, very good question because as you know, Schrodinger equation cannot be derived just like Newton's equation cannot be derived. Okay, because any new theory is a theory which the creator places before you based on observation. Because what do scientists do? Scientists, they observe nature and they try to figure out that can be by a minimum set of assumption, can we explain the whole plethora of variety of data or variety of observation that we see all around us? And by observing, they say, okay, there is some pattern. And when they try to quantitatively formulate the pattern, they arrive at the precise mathematical laws governing the physical phenomena. So Newton, for example, based on Galileo's experiments and his experiments, he found that 
objects that are not acted upon by force, they seem to either be at rest or move with uniform velocity. But if you want to change the uniform velocity to changing velocity, that means acceleration, then you have to apply a force. And that's the reason why Newton came upon, formulated the second law of motion, which is mass times second derivative of position is equal to force. It cannot be derived from anything. You can only formulate it based on observation. Similarly, Schrodinger, he wanted to understand why does Bohr, his ad hoc Bohr summer filled quantization rule, which is which says that when an electron is in an atom, then mass times speed times radius of the orbit is n times h bar. And from that, Bohr could derive successfully the energy levels of hydrogen atoms. But it was completely ad hoc. Bohr simply postulated that MVR is equal to nh bar. And then de Broglie said, de Broglie tried to describe that, well, if matter waves are having some wave amplitude, then the so-called Bohr uh, quantization, so Bohr quantization, MVR equal to NH pi to pi, can be explained as when an electron is going around an atom, the de Broglie wavelength is such, they form a standing wave. That means integral number of waves fit the circumference of the orbit. And immediately he could see that MVR equal to NH pi 2 pi exactly explains the de Broglie wavelength lambda equal to H by MV and the integral number of wavelength. But many people were not satisfied by this kind of ad hoc explanation, including Schrodinger. Schrodinger said, well, if the matter waves as postulated by de Broglie is a wave, then wave must have an amplitude. So he called that wave amplitude to be psi. And he said, well, psi, if it's an amplitude, what kind of an equation does it satisfy? So he guessed that the equation, bracket starting minus h bar square by 2 del square plus b, bracket close, acting on psi is equal to i h bar by del, del psi by del t. This equation, when you take the potential energy to be the hydrogen-like potential minus Z square by R, then he could get back the hydrogen energy levels exact. So then Schrodinger knew that this equation must be a correct equation. All right. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think this is not the nicest explanation I have ever uh, heard of. Uh, for the Schrodinger's effort, definitely. I, I now we should uh, go to the another questions like that is like, what is the role of quantum mechanics in Big Bang theory? If you want to take it now, or we can take it later. Sure, sure. We can we can take it now. Uh, okay. So Big Bang theory is based on classical general relativity, okay? So classical general relativity, when it is applied to um, the entire universe, that means when you apply the classical general relativity to the cosmos where on large scale, the galaxies, quasars, uh, active galactic nuclei, if you look at the large scale distribution, how big a scale? Scale being larger than few hundred million light years. On such scales, if you average out the density of the matter, which are locked up in galaxies, active galactic nuclei, etc., you will find they are uniform. And for such uniformly distributed matter, if you apply general relativity, 
the so-called Friedman equation, the uh, rather I should be uh, scientifically more correct because it was actually predicted even earlier by Lemaitre. So today we call it Lemaitre, sorry, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson Walker model. In such a model, based on classical general relativity, you can show that you get expanding or contracting solution. But from Hubble observation, we know that distances between galaxies are increasing with time. That means we are in an expanding uh, universe. So in the past, the galaxies were much closer to each other. If you go beyond, galaxies were on top of each other. If you go beyond that, they were all a soup of matter. If you even go further, you could go to hot and dense plasma. If you go to further for, uh, towards the, that means you go 13.8 billion years ago, you will find that the density of matter becomes infinite, temperature becomes infinite. So classical general relativity tells us that the Big Bang epoch consisted of infinite density and infinite temperature universe. But infinities really don't exist in the real world. Infinities signal singularities. And singularities is a bad news in physics. Why? Because all physical equations are differential equations. And to solve differential equations, you need boundary conditions. And boundary conditions can never be infinity. So the moment you have infinity, your physical laws break down. So does it mean that the Big Bang being of infinite density and infinite temperature, does it mean the laws of physics uh, don't operate? Many physicists will say, well, classical general relativity is no longer valid. But we know that at some time, you have to take quantum gravity. That means you have to quantize general relativity so that you get quantum gravity. And in quantum gravity, as you know, Planck, as early as his Planck's constant, Planck had, he was a great physicist. So he had immediately realized that if there is a constant like H, Planck's constant, then using the Planck's constant, you can derive three scales, the so-called Planck length, Planck time, Planck mass. For example, Planck mass is square root of H into C divided by Newton's gravitational constant. If you know the formulation of Planck mass, you can find out what is Planck length. Planck length is nothing but H divided by Planck mass into C. That means the Compton wavelength using the Planck mass. And therefore, physicists believe that when the universe size becomes Planck size, then classical general relativity cannot be valid. That means the approximate classical general relativity cannot be valid. So people believe that when the universe was less than 10 to the power minus 43 seconds, Planck time is 10 to the power minus 43 seconds. So when the universe age was less than 10 to the power minus 42 or 10 to the power minus 40 seconds, then you can't use classical cosmology based on general relativity. You have to use classical general relativity. And many physicists believe that when you use quantum gravity, then you will not have the Big Bang singularity. Everything will be smooth. You will not get infinities. And in fact, uh, quantum gravity uh, based on Abhay Ashtekar and his uh, collaborators work, the so-called loop space quantum gravity or the other quantum gravity inspired by uh, the string theory, both have their own cosmology, string cosmology and loose, loop space quantum gravity cosmology. Uh, both these, they don't have the so-called singularity. So indeed, it is believed that if you have the right quantum gravity, you will understand the Big Bang universe at the starting point much better. But unfortunately, today we don't know uh, 
which is the correct quantum gravity or what is the correct quantum gravity we don't because experimental verification is not possible because they will be verified only at planck energy scale planck energy scale is 10 to 19 giga electron volt while today our accelerators like large hadronic collider they can accelerate only up to tera electron volts while we need 10 to 19 giga electron volts that means 10 to 16 tera electron volts without such high energy at our disposal we cannot test quantum gravity so at the moment the role of quantum theory at the big bang epoch there are many theoretical models but we don't know how far they are correct yeah we are still hopeful that in coming future the way uh, technology is advancing we will soon have those kind of accelerators or we may find some other kind of naturally occurring accelerators and if we can find like uh, jets astrophysical jets are doing that kind of uh, acceleration particle acceleration if some way we can define some experiments based on those jets we can study some sophisticated interactions true but note that the highest energy particles so far detected are the high energy cosmic rays and the highest energy cosmic ray is 10 to power 21 electron volts 10 to power 21 electron volts is far smaller than the planck scale energy which is 10 to ah, power yeah. 19 giga electron volts Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. There is another question by Ritika Dube. Why there is only two spins for electrons? I. Yeah. yeah. So this is an experimental situation that electrons. Remember, uh, ultimately, fundamental nature of objects all around they come from experimental studies. So. when we study the electron we find through stern gerlach experiment that when we subject them to inhomogeneous magnetic field then they go in two diverse ways from that we conclude that there are two distinct spin state and when you do the theoretical analysis you find that they the spin angular momentum for electrons can be represented by the poly spin matrices for example the z component of the spin angular momentum will be h bar by 2 into the 2 by 2 matrix 1 0 0 minus 1 x component will be h bar by 2 into 0 1 1 0 matrix poly spin matrix and so on so therefore because the operators describing the spin degrees of freedom for the electron are 2 by 2 matrices they can be only two eigen values and eigen values are what we observe in uh, any experimental uh, result and therefore they can be only two distinct spin uh, values for the electron but ultimately it is the experiment that tells us uh what how many different spin states more fundamental if you want to go to more theoretically fundamental uh statement about uh why electrons have two spin state ultimately i have to say that the quantum mechanical state that describes an electron or a positron is a so called dirac spinner and a dirac spinner is a four component fields psi1 psi2 psi3 psi4 let me see whether i have a dirac spinner uh, field. yeah 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 i have so really speaking the dirac equation that describes so this is paul dirac and this is the so called dirac equation the dirac spinner psi that describes electrons and positron 
they are actually uh, column vector which is which has four values so for example for positive energy solution namely electrons you could be the upper state will be 1 0 and 0 1 while for positron negative energy solution the third and fourth entry could be 1 0 and 0 1 and these are the two distinct uh, spin states for the uh, electrons and positrons so the more fundamental reason why electrons and positrons or for that matter quarks are spin half particle is because they are described by dirac spinors which obey the so called dirac equation okay uh, i hope uh, ritika is got her answer and now we can take another very interesting um, uh, question by shumit kesharwani he want to ask like what is role of quantum mechanics inside black holes uh yes uh, the point is that inside black hole i don't know whether i have a picture of that but doesn't matter yeah. yeah so as you know black holes are classical solutions of general relativity uh, in which you are matter is compressed so much that the size goes below the event horizon and then the matter of course collapses to a singular point according to classical general relativity and we know that because of the event horizon anything that happens below the event horizon we can never see that because light cannot come out of the event horizon okay and there is a paradox called information loss paradox associated with quantum mechanics which started from hawking's prediction that if you apply quantum mechanics around black holes then the event horizon of a black hole behaves like a black body and black holes actually when you apply the quantum mechanics black holes also radiate particles thermally the event horizon appears like a black body and therefore a paradox arises and the paradox is as follows suppose i create a black hole using a quantum mechanical uh system like let's say i take a bose einstein condensate okay i take a bose einstein condensate large number of particles are in the bose einstein condensate okay so a whole in fact i have myself worked on it to create uh, supermassive black holes but that is a separate thing but you can create a black hole using a quantum mechanical state and according to quantum evolution the schrodinger evolution of the quantum mechanical state you will create a black hole but according to hawking after some time black hole will completely evaporate away because of hawking radiation because of thermal radiation if that is so doesn't it violate quantum mechanics why because in quantum mechanics all time evolution is given by schrodinger equation and schrodinger evolution says that a wave function will evolve to wave function wave function will not evolve to multiple number of wave function while thermal radiation black body radiation 
is not a single wave function. Black body radiation, quantum mechanically, is this wave function with this probability, another wave function with other probability, and so on. While you created a wave black hole using a single wave function, but when the black hole got evaporated, the evaporated particles each have different wave function. And this is not allowed by quantum mechanics. And this is the paradox called black hole information loss paradox. And many people have been trying to solve the black hole information loss paradox. There are many ideas uh, and it's not clear uh, which is the true resolution of black hole information loss paradox. But I like my friend uh, Samir Mathur's resolution. Professor Samir Mathur uh, is currently a professor in Ohio State University. He started his career in TIFR as an astrophysicist working on dynamics of galaxies. But after his PhD, he switched over to string theory and he became an outstanding string theorist. And uh, he has been describing black holes in terms of string, macroscopic string states called the so-called fuzzballs. So his fuzzball idea uh, is quite popular. Now many people work uh, on the fuzzball idea that was uh, started by Samir Mathur. And Samir Mathur's resolution of uh, the information loss paradox is exactly what you have asked, the quantum mechanics, a role of quantum mechanics inside the black hole. So in Samir Mathur's idea, the black hole is nothing but a large string which is oscillating quantum mechanically. And time to time, when this large super string describing the black hole, as it is oscillating, when it goes from one state to another state, it gives out a particle quantum mechanically. And it is this set of particles which are the Hawking radiation. And Samir Mathur has shown that because this is a full quantum mechanical process, quantum mechanics is not violated. So there is no information loss. So indeed, in Samir Mathur's resolution of black hole information loss paradox using his uh, macroscopic fuzzball, utilizes quantum mechanics inside the black hole. Wow. And it, it is really a very nice, very descriptive answer. And hope Sumit will be interested to look into the work by uh, Professor Samir Mathur. And now we can talk, uh, take another question, which is really a very uh, uh, nice. After, uh, when it's asked by Sudeep. He's asking like after tunneling, energy of the wave function remains same why there is no decrease in energy? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Very, very good question. Yeah. Yeah, so, so here is a uh, diagram illustrating quantum tunneling. So it's a very good question. It is true that if you have a potential barrier and you have a particle coming in with energy less than the uh, barrier height, then although classically you don't expect the particle to be found on the other side of the uh, barrier, but quantum mechanically you do see that the particles at the other side, the energy is exactly same. How do you see that energy this side and this side is same? As you can see, the wavelength on this side and the wavelength this side is same. On the other hand, the intensity has dropped, okay? But the wavelength is identical, but the intensity has dropped, signifying that the probability of quantum tunneling is small. Now, the reason why the energy has to be same is because the potential barrier 
is not time dependent it is time independent and you know that when the potential energy is time independent then from the schrodinger equation you can prove energy is conserved okay so no matter what happens the energy will be conserved but then you might ask fine energy is conserved so whatever was energy here the energy is here but what happens inside the barrier because in the barrier inside the barrier the energy if it is e while the potential energy is u0 how can the energy inside the barrier still remain e the only way you can think of why how the total energy can be still e all the potential energy is still u0 is a kinetic energy is negative but you will ask oh, this is not classically possible classically kinetic energy is half mv square or p square by 2 m and because of the quadratic nature the kinetic energy can never be negative so what is happening the answer is that well ultimate check is can you find the particle inside the barrier with kinetic energy if you find it then that will be indeed a uh, counter to your notion of physics and it is here uncertainty principle protects quantum mechanics so suppose you have a particle which is tunneling through a barrier and you say what i will do is i'll use my probe to find out the particle when the particle is exactly inside the barrier and then i'll be able to know whether its kinetic energy is negative or not but then you will immediately realize it's not possible why because in order to find out whether the particle was inside the barrier remember the barrier has a finite width if you want to know whether the particle is within the barrier you have to use a photon whose wavelength is smaller than the barrier width because otherwise you can't find out the particle position remember the fundamental rule of finding the particle it is the diffraction limited uncertainty delta theta is equal to 1.22 lambda divided by uh, the size of your optical device so therefore if you want to find the particle when it is inside the barrier you have to choose the wavelength of your probe photon to be very small and you can show that to probe that your wavelength will be so small that when it detects the particle here it will already impart such a large momentum to the particle inside that its total kinetic energy will be positive so therefore you will never see the particle to have negative kinetic kinetic energy even when it is in the barrier so in other words the uncertainty principle has protected the quantum mechan mechanics even in the tunneling uh, phenomena thank you sir that was a really detailed answer so thank we'll you, go we'll go to the next question by arpit so his question is why only certain pairs of observables are bounded together in uncertainty principle like position and momentum energy and time etc also what rule decides their uh, this pair combination uh, that satisfies the uncertainty uncertainty principle right very good that's a good question so as you know in quantum mechanics the observables they are described by linear operators a and in particular all observables are described by operators which are hermitian operators self adjoint operators because the self adjoint operators their eigen values are real and in an experiment when you measure it is only the eigen values that are observed how do we know it we know it from the spectra discrete spectra because the elements have discrete energy levels and when we try to measure their energy state from the discrete spectra we see 
that in, indeed their energy levels correspond to the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian operator. Similarly, the angular momentum operator, their eigenvalues are what we observe. Spin angular momentum, the poly matrices, it is their eigenvalues that appear as the spin angular momentum h bar by two or minus h bar by two for electrons and positrons and so on. Now it turns out that from functional analysis, a branch of mathematics, you can prove that two linear operators can have simultaneous eigenfunction or eigenstates if and only if, or rather, if the two operators commute. That means if you take two operators A and B, they will have simultaneous eigenstates if AB is equal to BA, all right? And when we make a measurement, as you know, when you make a measurement of a system and I see a value of an observable to be A1, then we know at that time, the state of the system has collapsed to an eigenstate of the operator with eigenvalue A1. So the eigenstate corresponds to the eigenvalue A1. So therefore, if you are measuring two observables simultaneously, then the observables that are being measured together, when you measure, the collapse of the wave function would be to a single state. And the single state must be common eigenstate of both of the observables. But that is possible only if both the observables commute. And hence, all the observables which commute with each other, you can simultaneously measure them. And there are no uncertainties because you can, they have simultaneous eigenfunctions or eigenstates. And therefore, you can measure all commuting set of observables together simultaneously without any answer. But if you have two operators and they do not commute with each other, then you will not have a common set of eigenstates. And therefore, you can never simultaneously measure them. For example, the commutator bracket of position and momentum, x px minus px x is i h bar. From this, I know x and p both do not have simultaneous eigenfunction. For example, in position representation, the eigenfunction of px is e raised for i by h bar px x, where px is eigenvalue. While the position eigenfunctions are Dirac delta function, delta x minus x. So they are different. Okay. And therefore, you cannot simultaneously measure both position and momentum. And hence, the generalized uncertainty principle tells us that if you have two Hermitian operators A and B, such that the commutator bracket of AB is I, that is iota, into another Hermitian operator C, that means AB equal to I into C, then you can actually mathematically prove that delta A into delta B is average value of C divided by four. And you can use this general result and you can show that from commutator bracket of x, p, x equal to i, h bar, you'll get back your uncertainty result delta x into delta p, x is equal to h bar by two. You can prove it. So in other words, uncertainty principle the general uncertainty principle is valid for any pair of observables corresponding to which the operators do not commute. Okay. Thank you, sir. That was a clear explanation. I hope uh, Arpit got the answer that he was looking for. So let's go to the next question by Vishnu. Oh, it's an interesting question. So he's asking, is the uncertainty principle uh, supporting or violating law of inertia? 
So in inertia, we talk about rest or motion of particle, but in uncertainty, we are trying to measure both at the same time. Uh, well, uh, then I'll qualify the question. The principle of inertia, which is Newton's first law, states that an object which is not acted upon by any force either remains at rest or continues to move with uniform velocity. It doesn't tell anything about position. It tells only about momentum. It says that if there is no force, either the momentum of the system is zero or the momentum is conserved and some constant. Principle of inertia never will tell you anything about the position. So, the uncertainty principle in that sense is consistent with the first law of Newtonian motion that, well, if I don't measure the position of a particle, I can find out the momentum of the particle with infinite precision. That means the error can be as small as I wish of the momentum as long as I'm not bothered about the position, okay? So in this sense, uncertainty principle is not in contradiction with the first law of Newtonian mechanics. On the other hand, second qualification I'll make is this, that you might say, well, if the particle is at rest, then it must, according to Newtonian idea, if the particle is at rest, it will have a definite position, which is true. In Newtonian mechanics, which is classical result, if a particle is at rest, the particle has a definite position classical, but not true in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, a particle at rest means the momentum is zero. It doesn't mean the particle's position is, uh, fixed. In quantum mechanics, a particle at rest means the momentum is zero, but the particle can be anywhere in the universe. You don't know where the particle is. And that is the reason, in fact, it is such argument which tells us that a harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics, the ground state of the harmonic oscillator cannot be ground state energy of the harmonic oscillator cannot be zero. Why? Go back to Newtonian mechanics of a harmonic oscillator, like a pendulum. In Newtonian mechanics, you will say, well, a pendulum can be at rest. And if it is at rest, then uh, its momentum is zero, so kinetic energy is zero. And because in Newtonian mechanics, a rest particle has position fixed, and for a pendulum, the position is at the minimum of the gravitational potential energy, which I can take it to be zero. And therefore, the total energy, kinetic energy plus gravitational potential energy is zero. So a simple pendulum uh, in Newtonian mechanics has zero energy, but not so in quantum mechanics. The moment you apply quantum mechanics and ask what is the ground state energy, then Ground state energy cannot be zero. Why? Because it cannot have a definite position. Because if it has a definite position, its momentum is completely unknown. But if the momentum is completely unknown, the kinetic energy will be completely unknown. So therefore, although potential energy will be zero, but a kinetic energy is infinitely uncertain and therefore infinite. So it can't be the ground state energy. Okay? So it can't be at single position, but can it have zero momentum and be at the zero, zero potential energy state? It can't be because if it has zero momentum, means you know the momentum perfectly. If you know the momentum perfectly, then the position cannot be fixed and therefore it can't be in the ground state potential energy. And that is the reason why when you do the quantum mechanics of harmonic oscillator, you will have zero point energy of half h bar omega, 
where omega is square root of k by m, k being the spring constant. So the zero point energy of harmonic oscillator comes about because you have to be consistent with the Heisenberg's uncertainty. Well, I gave a long answer. I went a little bit outside to the main question, but I thought it is important. Uh, in other words, what I tried to say is if you take the first law per se, it is not in contradiction with Heisenberg uncertainty principle because at rest means momentum is zero. It doesn't mean that position is different. Is that clear? Sir. Uh. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, sir, I am Arindam from Medinipur. Right. Yeah. yeah. I have one question. Um, as you said, uh, particle cannot be localized. And, well, uh, no, I didn't I have... say particle cannot be localized. You can localize a particle with a position uncertainty delta x. You can localize it narrowly. No? Yes, uh, sir. My question is uh, slightly different. Uh, for the uh, interference pattern, um, as they are particles so the wave nature, and after the fringe pattern, we can see some there is somewhere is light and somewhere is dark means uh, we are uh, somehow we are uh, localizing the wave or quantizing the wave in some space how it is happening yeah yeah so that what you are saying is correct when i detect something in position space yes. i am localizing localizing it in position space here is the diagram so imagine that a particle is sent through a hole then because of diffraction, the wave packet will become longer in uh, the uh, span of the wave function. And I have localized detector. Here is a position uh, electron detector here. A here is another electron detector. So when I detect, I don't know which detector will see the electron, but one of the detectors will click. So when the a detector sees the electron, then the electron is anywhere within this detector. So the electron has got localized. Earlier, it was not localized. It had a bigger width. But when you detect it, you detect it within localized. So in an interference experiment, for example, yeah, it comes as a wave. But when you see a, having a photographic plate, when the particle hits the photographic plate, it gets localized, but this point is not a ideal mathematical point with zero dimension. It is the grain size of your photographic plate, which is as long as a uh, few hundred uh, nanometers. So yeah, when you detect the electron or a photon in this plate, you localize it within few hundred thousand nanometer, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Have I answered your question? Yes, sir. So, Arpit, uh, you had a question, so you may ask if you want directly. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, sir in EMI, I was initially thinking about a problem. I was imagining a photon traveling in a space, a single photon. And that time I had only had an introductory course in quantum mechanics and I was going through H.C. Verma's quantum mechanics few chapters. So I read that uh, a, a single photon has a certain uh, state, but upon measurement, we get electric field along a particular direction and magnetic field uh, perpendicular to that. Before measurement, there, is, there can be anything, but there is only one upon measurement. So if I imagine a wave coming towards me, I'm standing on X axis, and a wave is coming towards me, and I click a picture of that, or, or an analogy to that, there is a medium which measures the disturbance, electromag electromagnetic disturbance, and it can capture, it is in a, in a form on, the, on a 2D space. So what figure that it looks like? Because I was imagining if that uh, disturbance is proportional to the lambda, then I try to calculate the energy density, 
and energy density was coming proportional to frequency because lambda was coming in denominator so energy density was increasing parabolically so i just thought there should be an upper limit to the density of energy because there are certain thing quantized and after like two and a half years i calculated that thing with some constraint but i didn't got that area figure i calculated through some other physical constraint and i calculated planck frequency accident uh, accidentally uh, so i was convinced that i'm going in right direction so i tried to measure other quantities mentioned in the wikipedia page as planck units and i tried to derive them but accidentally i derived frequency with another physical constraint but this time the frequency was given with a lower bound i rechecked my calculation and i was having simultaneously two derivation one which is verified with internet and second with the similar approximations using some physical constraints of relativity and quantum mechanics i got a lower value of frequency so there is a possible lower value of frequency and there is a possible highest value of frequency and i got physical explanation as well that what will happen beyond these frequencies and what will happen below these frequencies and somehow i'm getting into a direction that how energy is converting into mass and what kind of thing is happening mathematically over there which is making uh, energy like photon which has no inertia making it to convert into inertia such that before it was moving with the speed of light and later on it is not possible for it to be able to travel with the speed of light when it becomes in the form of matter so i was calculating these things mathematically but i want to know like what is happening there over there like all the physical quantities are coming constrained from lower bound and upper bound and i am getting all the physical explanation along with the mathematical derivations of that well i have to see your calculations myself but uh, some of the things you said uh, are uh, not quite right uh, it is this energy doesn't convert get converted to mass or mass doesn't convert it doesn't get converted to energy this is wrong uh, understanding mass is energy energy is mass e could mc square simply means that anything that has energy e has inertial mass e by c square or anything that has mass m is equivalent to having energy mc square so uh, it is not correct to say that uh, energy got converted to mass or mass got converted to energy what you might say is well if you have a photon coming in and you detect it when you detect a photon then photon gets lost and photons inertia if photon is having frequency nu then its inertial mass will be h nu divided by c square this h nu divided by c square which was the mass of the photon when you detect it and your detector absorbs the full photon the detector's mass increases by h nu by c square that's all if you take into account all this i am sure you will find that your calculations come out all right so then why does this disturbance when not detected travels with the speed of light why that uh, measured uh, no, no. The, momentum was not only, there only yeah yeah only those particles can move with speed c whose rest mass is zero remember rest mass zero doesn't mean that the particle has zero mass rest mass equal to zero means that if it has energy e its mass associated with energy is e by c square indian mass is special relativity formula go back to your special relativity formula e is equal to square root of p square c square m0 square c4 where m0 is the rest mass equal to 0 then e is equal to p into c but it doesn't mean that mass is zero mass will be e divided by c square so in other words photons their rest mass is zero but photons having frequency nu they have a mass h nu divided by c square sir why that mass is only defined for velocity of light or velocity of light divided by the no, no, no. Any, anything that has energy e has mass e divided by c square 
any so, sir, why then uh, we cannot have an a photon relative velocity to us anything except c no that's because of the fact that rest mass of a photon is zero uh, i'll give you the proof the proof is very simple from special relativity you know the relation that if you have a particle with rest mass m0 moving with a speed v then the observer in which the particle is moving with speed v will find the mass of the particle to be m equal to m0 divided by square root of 1 minus v square by c square okay Yes, and sir. therefore, from this equation, you know that rest mass m0 is equal to m into square root of 1 minus v square by c square, where m is the mass measured by the observer for whom the particle is moving with a velocity v. So you have the equation rest mass m0 is equal to m into square root of 1 minus v square by c square. Now, if you put v equal to c, you will get m0 equal to 0. So in other words, any particle that moves with speed c has to have rest mass m0 equal to 0. All right. And also from the same equation, m equal to m0 by square root of 1 minus b square by c square, you know that if m0 is not 0, the particle in order to move with speed c, it has to have infinite mass because if m0 is not 0, if you put v equal to c, c, m becomes infinite. In other words, its energy is infinite. That means to accelerate a particle of non-zero rest mass to speed c, you have to give infinite energy. But no one has infinite energy. Infinite energy is not possible. And that is the reason no particle whose rest mass is non-zero can ever move with speed c. But it can approach. It can have 0 0.99 c, 0 0.99999 c, 0 0.99999999 c, and so on. Sir, I already took into the account the uh, speed of light constraint. Like my all the calculations were made only for the velocity of light. And uh, in yeah, but uh, the, when the light that... is detected, when the photon is detected by a detector, the photon gets absorbed. No? Photon is gone. Entire energy now goes into the detector. Sir, but in Griffith's quantum mechanics chapter number seven, it is written that uh, at every point in universe there is already electric and magnetic field defined, and the disturbance in this field only moves not with true. a certain. That is not true. That is not true. Saying that Griffith's quantum mechanics chapter number seven, it no, is no, written you read, every point. you read carefully. Okay, I'll go through you it. Sorry, sir. Because remember that if you produce an electromagnetic wave in your lab, it doesn't have infinite extent in both space and time. It was created today and it has moved in time t, it has moved the distance c into t. So, therefore, the wave has a finite length c into p. So the electric field is not there everywhere. It is only there along the length of the electromagnetic wave. Okay, sir. I got it. Thank you, sir. Most welcome. Okay, so uh, we are coming to the final uh, few questions. So uh, one is by Vishnu. So um, how did elements available in the periodic table come in picture? Well, the uh, uh, elements uh, came about because of strong interaction. As you know, once in the universe, so universe to begin with was very hot. And in a very hot state, the average energy of particles is very higher. And when the average energy of particles were greater than 200 mega electron volts, 200 MeV, then particles were in the form of electrons, photons, positrons, neutrinos, and quarks. But in the theory of strong interaction, 
one knows that there is a phase transition, the so-called QCD phase transition, in which when the energy fell to 150 MeV, that is 150 million electron volts or smaller, there was a QCD phase transition in which quarks combined to form hadrons, that is quarks combined, U, U and D quarks combined to form protons, U, D and D quarks combined to form neutrons and so on. And protons and neutrons are stable hadrons. So when the universe cooled after few seconds, uh, few minutes of the age of the universe, you were left with photons, neutrinos, electrons, and uh, protons and neutrinos. And then the first element, when it cooled further to temperature less than 10,000 degree Kelvin, a single proton captured an electron and formed hydrogen atom. And during and earlier on, during uh, when the universe was few minutes uh, old only, uh, two protons and two neutrons combined to form helium nucleus. And when the universe cooled down further, helium nucleus captured two more electrons to form helium atom. So primordial uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis uh, could synthesize lighter elements like helium, deuterium, lithium. But the bulk of the heavier elements got synthesized in the core of the stars during the thermonuclear reactions going on in the central regions of the stars, where helium combined with more protons to form carbon nucleus, then formed oxygen, carbon, helium combined, then nitrogen and so on. So heavier elements were progressively formed in the core of massive stars. So by combination of protons and neutrons, all elements of the periodic table were formed. And largely it is the strong interaction that was responsible for the protons and neutrons to come together to give rise to heavier nuclei. Is that all right? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much. So the last question in the chat is by Sudeep. So Sudeep, if you want, you could ask your question about the black, hole, black body system. Okay. So, uh, sir, my main question was uh, how a black body uh, um, continuously, uh, I mean, sir, uh, the spectrum of black body, how it is being continuous while the hydrogen or sodium, uh, they uh, eject this continuous spectrum. Oh, very good question. Very good question. Yeah. So uh, the hint was already given to me, uh, given by me earlier on. And that is from quantum mechanics, you can show that if you take a bound state, like for example, in a hydrogen atom, an electron is in a bound state with the proton. Bound state, what is the definition of a bound state? Bound state is a state where the energy is less than the energy of the components of the system if they were all moved to infinite distance. So for example, if you take an electron and a proton and move it to further distance, and they are still at rest, then their kinetic energy and potential energy will be zero. While if you bring electron and proton to close and make a bound state, it's kinetic energy and plus potential energy will be negative. So for bound state, you can prove using Schrodinger equation by matching the wave function of the electron at large distances and the wave function at uh, closer distance, because at large distance, the electron doesn't see any electrostatic potential. So it's the wave function would be like plane wave function. But at short distances, it sees 
the uh, electrostatic potential. So its wave function would be very different. So when you match the wave function, the batching is possible only for certain values of energy. So from this basic qualitative idea, one can prove that for bound state, the energy levels are always discrete. And hence, it is not a surprise that the energy eigenvalues of uh, bound states are discrete and in particular elements like hydrogen, calcium, magnesium, where the electrons are in a bound state around the nucleus, the energy, potential energy and plus kinetic energy is negative and therefore they are bound and therefore their energy eigenvalues according to quantum mechanics are discrete. But for a black body, the black body photons are not bound, they are free. They are bones bouncing about each other. Uh, I mean, each other meaning the walls. If you take a very large uh, box uh, coated with mirror uh, uh, lining, very large box, as large as the earth or anything, and uh, introduce photons and let them bounce about and thermalize, the photons are not in bound, they are free uh, photons. And in quantum mechanics, the free energy is never quantized. So for example, if you take a free particle having a definite momentum, its wave function is e raised to power i by h bar p dot r minus e into t. The momentum can be any eigenvalue, uh, any value, energy can be any value. So they have a continuous spectrum. So for free particles, the energy can be continuous and it is not a surprise therefore that the black body radiation uh, spectrum is continuous. Have I un uh, answered you, Sudhir? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, one more. If, if we create a black body uh, system consisting of any, uh, any of the gas like sodium or hydrogen, then we will see continuous spectrum. No, no, what you are saying, uh, let us be very, very precise in our formulation. If you take a sodium vapor or hydrogen vapor, put cylinder. Yes, sir. And now heat them so that there is a lot of black body photons. Mm -hmm. The black body photons, they will have a continuous spectrum. And you will find the hydrogen atoms or uh, sodium atoms in different excited states. And different excited states, so they'll be, when they will be coming down to uh, 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 lesser energy level, they'll be also emitting photons. So what will be the final spectrum? The final spectrum will be, the black body photons will be black body continuous spectrum, but superposed on them will be the emission lines because the excited hydrogen atoms and excited sodium atoms will be also producing their own emission line. I'm assuming that the black, the average temperature of the black body radiation is more than 10,000 degree Kelvin. Then you will have uh, emission line. But if your black body temperature itself is smaller, then they will not be able to excite the hydrogen and sodium uh, atoms, rather hydrogen and atom, uh, sodium atom will absorb it. Then the spectrum will be, you'll have the black body spectrum, but then in some regions, depending on the energy level, there'll be absorption lines. So you'll have absorption lines over the black body radiation. By the way, these are not idealized experiments. Your stellar spectrum are exactly like that. If you take the spectrum of the sun, sun's photosphere is a black body of 6,000 degree Kelvin. But if you actually measure the spectrum, you don't see only the continuum black body spectrum. There are emission lines and absorption lines. Why? Because the just immediately above the photosphere of the sun, there are cool hydrogen gas, there are cool helium gas, there are cool carbon, oxygen, and other uh, elemental gas. Some of them emit 
So there are emission lines, some of them absorb, there are absorption lines. So you see the continuum spectrum from the photosphere as well as the absorption and emission lines. All right, Sadiq? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Most welcome. Yeah, thank you, sir. It was really very uh, uh, mesmerizing explanations of the questions from uh, uh, all the participants. In fact, it is really, really long session, and I am very, I am very sure that you must have been tired by now. No, no, I am not tired. I am a teacher. I am used to taking two hours continuously. In fact, my students, because when I teach in classroom, I forget the time, so I'll be continuously teaching. And some students stop me, saying, "Sir, you have not realized already we are a half an hour overshot." <laughs> so when I <laughs> teach. Uh, yeah, this, I get involved in physics and I forget time. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Excuse so, me, sir. The, can I see something? Sir, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, if possible, can I come to Delhi to like show my calculations and everything to discuss? Because uh, sir, I, uh, well, I, unfortunately, not for another one year because I am on my sabbatical and uh, currently I am in Bhubaneswar because there was some tragedy and uh, I don't want to be in Delhi for a very, very long time to forget certain sad memories. And I've already taken sabbatical and uh, till 31st of August, 2022, I'm not going to Delhi. Sorry to hear that, sir. Uh, it's okay, sir. Yeah, it happens. COVID, COVID has come as a uh, very bad uh, thing to most of the families in the world. Yeah, sir, we are also, I mean, we have lost a great personality from outreach community in India. And we really feel that gap. Uh, anyway, I will just take another uh, question uh, which came to my mind that is related to uh, like one statement somebody had made like every particle in the universe, I mean every quantum particle in the universe are somehow entangled to each other. What is your comment on this? Well, that is true. In fact, I have been thinking about it myself for a long time. So within the Hubble radius, that means within our causally connected region, C into T, where T is the age of the universe, within a radius of C into T, all the particles have interacted with each other. And therefore, the quantum mechanical states of all the particles within the Hubble radius are entangled with each other. That is very correct. But when the universe uh, was just formed within few Planck times, uh, not all particles were entangled with each other quantum mechanically because it is the interactions which cause entanglement. Okay, yeah. Okay, great. If pa uh, particles don't interact, then they are not entangled entangled quantum mechanically with others. Mm. But this is a very deep issue. In fact, I have been, uh, because uh, I mean, for a very long time, right from my MSc days, I was always trying to solve certain fundamental nature of quantum mechanics. Uh, and I have wasted a lot of time since MSc, including today, uh, thinking about it because it's such a deep problem that great physicists like Bohr, Einstein, Schrodinger, they have not solved it. Uh, but it's such a beautiful puzzle that it attracts me all the time. I have wasted a lot of time, but it's okay. Uh, I don't think thinking about deep issues is a waste of time. You might not improve your curriculum vitae by uh, thinking about it, but nevertheless, you they bring a happiness uh, thinking about such deep issues. Yeah, sometimes they come up with something, some new insight about another problems in of course, which... of course. There's no doubt about it. Yes. 
So since this is a quantum uh, related stuff, so if we don't talk about quantum, uh, some of the quantum phenomena, what we see, uh, that is like collapse and revival. I was, re I was reading one paper uh, that was from 2013 and it says that they have experimentally found the evidences of collapse and revival uh, phenomena in quantum mechanics and in, in uh, some real system. So just want a few, uh, some, a few minutes of your comments on certain topics, like one is quantum collapse and revival phenomena. No, I haven't read the uh, problem, but uh, any detection can be viewed as a collapse, but need not be. As you know, the famous Schrodinger cat paradox, here is a, a picture of the famous Schrodinger cat paradox, where you have a, cobalt-60, uh, which, which is a unstable nucleus. And unstable nucleus means at any given time, the state of the cobalt-60 will be superposition of a decayed state and the ground state. That means there is a decay uh, or an excited state. Decay to a ground state with gamma photons and no decay, that means excited state. But uh, that is a quantum mechanical state. But if you put a cat with a Giger molar counter and all that stuff, then uh, you get into an entangled state. Quantum mechanics, Schrodinger equation will tell you that when you bring about an interaction with the cobalt 60 with the GM counter, amplifier, tape recorder, this talk, and the cat, the final system will be entangled state. But what we always see whenever we open the box, is not an entangled state. Either we see that there is a decay, there's a click, there's a talk, the cat is dead, or no decay, no click, no talk, cat is alive. So you can uh, interpret that when you do this, there is a collapse, that means does collapse in a decay state or not collapse into no decay state. But this is only an interpretation. There is a better interpretation called many world interpretation. In the many world interpretation, the world always uh, evolves into different branches. So there'll be a branch of the universe where there's a decay click of the GM counter, talk relate, cat dead, observer sees the cat dead. And there's another universe where there's no decay, no click, no uh, talk, no cat, uh, uh, cat is alive, the observer sees cat alive. And there are many, many uh, worlds which are always simultaneously existing. So this is the thing that Initially, there's a world with the film strip. The film strip divides into two strip, where there's one strip, one world where the cat is alive. You see the cat alive. Another strip, cat is dead and cat is alive. But then the many world theory, what it doesn't explain is how does the probabilities come in? Afterward, after all, in the Schrodinger evolution and the many world theory, there is no place for probabilities. Well, in the actual world, we see either cat alive with the probability, with some probability, or cat dead with the rest of the problem. So this born rule of probability, where, they, where do they emerge from? This is the central puzzle which has not been solved. And this is what I keep thinking time to time, of course, without solution. Uh, but nevertheless, great pleasure comes out of Thinking of possible resolution, I've tried to think of possible resolution using gravity and general relativity, but I still have not been able to arrive at the bond rule and therefore I have not published my results. But nevertheless, one should think. Um, and when you think about different resolution of this problem, you are filled with pleasure, although you may not be arriving at a solution. Thank you, sir. Uh, the, I think uh, uh, I will go for another, uh, I mean, comment on another uh, phenomena that we know, know, know as quantum teleportation. Can you, yes. can you put your comments on this? Yeah, let me see whether I have the slide on that. Yeah, so the con quantum teleportation is your No, I don't have the slide. Uh, what one is doing is that supposing I want to 
sent an atom that i have suddenly got to a large distance at a very large speed can i do it physically the answer is no you can't send the atom because the atom if you try to send it it has to respect special relativity because its rest mass is non zero so therefore you cannot move it with even with speed c but what you can do is you can take the atomic state and send the quantum state to another observer who will use that state to uh, create another particle there so quantum teleportation essentially means that your taking the quantum state here destroying it and reproducing the same state at a great distance almost instantaneous such simple quantum teleportation has been already performed very simple one not atoms but simply the quantum teleportation of the state of a photon such things have already been achieved and it doesn't violate any of the laws of either quantum mechanics or special theory of relativity yeah i mean from from a layman's uh, perspective it's like uh, destroying some bulk, some kind of information and reproducing another kind of informations it's like uh, some kind of violation for layman like uh, uh, we know that energy cannot be destroyed or recreated it can just return transform one form to another right yeah but here no such thing is happening neither the energy conservation is violated nor information um uh, nor there is any information loss all what you are doing is that i have a state quantum state here i am changing the quantum state here and transmitting somewhere else almost instantaneously where the same quantum state is created at some other point Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, yeah, change of mm-hmm. quantum state is involved, not destruction of quantum state. Yeah, it's really, really nice phenomena. Uh, I mean, taught in our uh, MSc quantum mechanics classes. Yeah, I mean, I hardly uh, remember all those details, but it's really, really very uh, fantastic phenomena. So now I will go to the very last question from my side. i mean that is uh, we want to comment on that it's like when we talk, think about big bang we say that entropy in the starting was really really very high then bang happened and then we have like uh, we have a structure formation and all those history and basically we have systems with entropy lower and and also in our lives we do see that entropy grows into entropy of a system what we familiar with is growing uh, with time so is it like initially we had very high entropy and in in between we had lower now we are having a growing entropy of the systems what is your comment on that sir actually it is the reverse you know the entropy the the full entropy of the universe is actually growing so for instance when before the era of decoupling that means before neutral hydrogen atoms were formed the universe was essentially protons electrons and photons of course there were neutrinos and then after the era of decoupling once the temperature of the universe fell below 1000 degree kelvin when neutral atoms were formed atoms cooled down but the total entropy actually increased you might say how the reason is that when the atoms form when the electron and proton combine the electron and proton's entropy decrease but when it combine it resulted in emission of a photon in a random direction so therefore 
the net entropy increased just like when the electron positron annihilated the period of electron positron annihilation there was a jump in the entropy and that is the reason why the photon temperature is higher than the neutrino temperature because uh, entropy electron positron annihilation caused an increase in the entropy so as the universe is actually becoming older and older the entropy the total entropy is increasing for example when galaxies were formed then it is true the the entropy of the matter that formed the galaxy is lower but in the process of formation of uh, the galaxy it cooled the baryon cooled and it radiated away there were gravitational degrees of freedom radiated away because the object spiraled in the long wavelength gravitational waves are emitted so gravitational waves carried away lot of entropy so the entropy of the universe actually when uh, is constantly increasing so in structure formation where homogeneous and isotropic matter actually gave rise to structure the entropy of the universe went up because the structures had lesser entropy but the formation of the structure involved radiating energy in the form of long wavelength gravitational waves away randomly away and that increased the total entropy so the second law of thermodynamics which says entropy always increases is supreme is universal it can never be violated so entropy is all the time increasing for example living system we our entropy as we grow from baby onwards as we are growing our internal entropy is decreasing but growth means what we are eating and our protein structure is increasing dna structure is increasing rna structure is increasing so therefore lessening of and disorder more increasing of order within but our body temperature it is emitting in random direction random energy in the form of heat so the environment entropy is increasing so in other words the total entropy increases but where there are ordered structures there the entropy is decreasing all right yes okay so basically one should consider all possible uh, scenarios to look uh, to i mean all the possible Now, one has to include the entropy of the environment also when you include the uh, entropy of the environment you will find the total entropy always increases yeah perfect perfect sir so now uh, i think uh, we can have uh, uh, some some questions from uh, the Uh, united science foundation members as well if they want or sure please go ahead or unmute yourself and ask if you want okay el sudeep you can ask your uh, your question you have written in the comment but we have time to time you can ask uh, okay uh, sir uh, please comment on uh, delayed choice of quantum experiments yeah this is a wheeler's famous uh, delayed choice where uh, you send a photon it strikes a beam splitter and uh, as you know quantum mechanically when you uh, view this result what happens is the photon as it strikes the half silvered mirror there is the photon state becomes a superposed state one state is getting reflected and going one way and other is getting transmitted and going other way and then when they re recombine you form an interference pattern so wheeler's delayed choice experiment is that when does the actual collapse takes place after all you are you have the free will to either place a detector in the 
one of the arms to check whether the photon has come in this path. If you detect that, then you know which path the photon has gone in. But since you have detected no more merging of the two states and interference, or you have the choice to not detect the photon along the path, but wait and see the interference pattern. Okay. So uh, the delayed choices, instead of sending, uh, that is, there is a time since you have sent a photon and the arms can be very long and you still have a time to decide whether to find which path the photon has taken or to wait and see the interference pattern. That means whether wave theory or position, that means path. You can decide what to uh, do. So your choice, but this is, there's no paradox involved in the delayed choice experiment. That means Wheeler's delayed choice is telling you that before you measure, neither the particle or path aspect is there, nor the wave aspect is there. Only upon measurement, you see which aspect of the quantum system you have measured. Okay, sir. Okay. So, um, thanks a lot. Pankas, do you want to comment on something? We have two Pankas, any Pankas, Pankas Kumar and Pankas Kuswaha. This was a really uh, amazing discussion. I have listened uh, so far. I have been part of anything. And uh, this is such an interesting discussion that uh, I'll thoroughly look everything again. And there are so many things I haven't understood, understood, but I can uh, uh, I, I can read by myself in detail. I got so much interest in so many things. And thank, thank you, you, so, thank you, uh, Professor Das. Thank you so much for uh, joining with us, and we are grateful to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Pankaj. Thank you. So basically, this is this is one reason why we violated uh, our time constraints. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so you can form a general uh, a rule uh, called violation of time versus understanding of physics. <laughs> Either yes. you violate the time or you understand properly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, Ratnesh this side. Hi, Dick. How? Hi, how are you? Uh, hello, sir. I just want to say thank you very much uh, for your time. Most welcome. It, most welcome. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Listening from you was really great and uh, the way you answered the queries of the students was like uh, amazing means uh, students also uh, never get a platform to, to uh, ask their questions and uh, today the discussions that happened I think uh, students must have been enlightened, enlightened a lot from these I hope thank so. you very much the, the point is yes. that uh, uh, you know uh, one can only go half a way, but those who are interested, I urge you to uh, read more. There are many uh, uh, articles and books where many of the things have been explained much more thoroughly. Uh, so, for example, regarding the quantum mechanical description of photoelectric effect, those who are interested in going to the actual uh, nitty gritty, I refer you to the excellent book uh, by JJ Sakurai called Advanced Quantum Mechanics. There you see the whole wave function and perturbative, perturbation, perturbat perturbation theory ap approach to describing the photoelectric effect. And for lasers, there is a a uh, full book by Luden called Quantum Theory of Light. So, uh, of course, the physics is a very 
a vast subject. Not every topic can be uh, gone thoroughly into it, but this is just a, uh, you know, uh, the a uh, menagerie of topics that I've covered. Uh, you can select one or two and go into details thoroughly. And a lot of things are happening today, particularly concerning uh, quantum optics and high temperature superconductivity and room temperature superconductivity, where quantum mechanics uh, will continue to play a big role. Thank you very much, sir. Most welcome. Uh, hello, sir. This is Pankaj Kuswaha. Uh, hi, Pankaj. Yeah, so first and foremost, Thanks a lot for this very nice and lucid explanation and intro to the subject. But with very You're welcome, but I thank all of you who have uh, had invited me for this. Uh, so, sure, that that's motivates us and that's what our goal is. But it's also, I mean, from our side, it's uh, I'll, uh, we are very, very happy that you actually agreed to our, uh, to provide us the time. The, and okay, so you have said a lot more than what I expected or what I was thinking. I'll just, uh, uh, maybe if it is not far, not too much for you, uh, well, uh, like ju you just mentioned the reference for uh, this uh, <clears throat> Jaja Sakurai reference for uh, these perturbation theories and these dealings. Uh, will it possible for you to just, uh, I mean, uh, and uh, photoelectric theory, sorry. Uh, Sorry. To provide us some references on each topic, uh, where to look for that would be a great asset. Or for, which uh, subtopic? I didn't get it. The topics which? that you have covered, and that you said that there are books which actually have much more and good lucid explanation on particular aspects of these different topics that you have mentioned. Uh, yes. So, uh, for foundational aspects of quantum mechanics, like delayed choice experiment, many world interpretation collapse. There is an excellent collection of papers uh, uh, edited by uh, uh, Zurek Z-U-R-E-K okay. Wheeler and Zurek. Okay, Wheeler. There is an excellent collection of articles which deal with this. Um, for uh, superconductivity of course I find uh, the book by Tinkham and uh, very good as far as superconductivity is there. For superfluidity and quantum mechanics, one can read Tile and Tile, T I L L E Y, Tile and Tile's book on superconductivity and superfluidity, where he takes a wave macroscopic wave function approach to explain. Okay. That's a very uh, good. So, depending on which area, if you spell out your area, I can suggest some references. Okay, sir. So, uh, I what uh, I will do are uh, in a couple of days probably. I will just. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I want these references or those particular chapters or some uh, those limited references, rather for my audiences or the people whom we are trying to actually pass the enjoy of science. Uh, sorry, joy of science. So, yeah. hmm. so what yeah, I will is, like is I will just give a, I mean, uh, probably a list and then you can just mention the references. You don't need to, I hope that would be okay for you if it is not much. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so I will just uh, pick the, the basics from your talk itself and then I will just pass it on to whoever is, I mean, I will pass it to everyone and though whoever is interested, they can dig up more and probably come up uh, uh, with the queries if they have. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Once again, uh, thanks a lot. That was a wonderful and very nice and lucid explanation. I have given her attendance. Most welcome. Most welcome. So, I also enjoyed the thorough discussions I had. It was a very, very fascinating discussion. Yeah. And uh, now I want some words from our council, another council member and. Uh, Treasurer of our society, now Preet Kaur, please uh, unmute yourself. Dr. Now Preet Kaur. 
Okay. So maybe uh, then I will switch to Deepthi S. Prabhu. She is also, she is also part of our council. Please uh, have a few words before we go to go for an official closure of the session. Yeah, so uh, as everyone has already uh, told, I, um, I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. And thank you so much, sir. So uh, this was the first opportunity for me to hear uh, you talk. And I have heard about you from many of my friends and colleagues that uh, how excellently you teach. Uh, in Delhi University. So uh, I have been fortunate to uh, be a part of this discussion. And thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you very much, Deepthi. Yeah. So finally, uh, sir, it's uh, really, I, I really don't want to end this session, but <laughs> something is started, it's the end. That is the law of nature. So we have to uh, end this session. And it was really, really very much uh, insightful for me uh, is, uh, personally to know more about quantum mechanics and quantum optics. What I had learned in my uh, MSc days and now I have almost forgotten most of that. But yes, this was really a very nice uh, session of our entire uh, uh, kind of initiatives. But uh, we, we request you to uh, share uh, your uh, uh, presentation with us so that we can formulate uh, a list of uh, topics and then we can have your uh, input on the uh, reference for those topics. Sure, I so, will send you a PDF of the yeah. slides. All right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, sir. Have a nice day ahead. Thank you, thank you. Same uh, to everyone. Uh, please take care and uh, be safe. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.